Brad Frost, I'm the manager of the Office of Community Relations. If you ever have questions about uh, an EPA concern, you can call me and my, I'll have my information up there later. We've got Chris Presnell, he's our environmental justice officer. We've got Anthony Miller, he's the permit reviewer. And we've got Mike Reed, he's the unit manager for, uh, one of the unit managers for the CAP unit. I'm going to let, uh, do, do you want to introduce yourself or? Thank you. Oh, thanks. I didn't expect that. Uh, my name is, Ho well, that's all right. Uh, my name is Jose Rikena. I'm with the Pilsen Alliance. We are a social justice advocacy organization here in the neighborhood. Happy to do work. We'll be celebrating our 20th anniversary next week. And, uh, you know, we are here because environmental justice is a social justice issue in my mind. Climate change. Um, it's going to affect the global south uh, much more than a lot of our industrial nations that have caused climate change. Uh, that is why a border wall seems to be such a need for this current administration. So I'm happy to have input at the end of this uh, event um, for what our angle is for what this project will be at Fisk um, Coal Fire Pilot. Uh, but thank you so much for Perro and the hard work that they do for environmental justice here in the neighborhood and we're looking forward to more partnerships. Thank you. And then uh, I think Rose Gomez is going to say a few words from Para. Thanks, everybody, for coming today to the meeting. My name is Rose, and I'm with Para, which is Pilsen Environmental, Pilsen Environmental Rights and Reform Inver um, Organization. And um, there's going to be a presentation by the Illinois EPA, and they will talk specifically about this FISC peaker plant and what that will entail. And uh, this is going to be our questions and answers afterwards, after the presentation. So if you could um, hold off on those questions and answers. And thanks everyone for coming to the meeting tonight. Thank you. So, oh, do you wanna run it? I mean, it might be easier. Okay. So, uh, as I think everyone is well aware, um, we're here tonight to talk about uh, the, the former Fisk generation plant, uh, which still has some, uh, it has some emission units at the facility, and we'll go through some of that. Um, so, why don't you go to the next slide? Okay. The Illinois EPA is a regulatory agency. So we implement the uh, federal and state laws that uh, apply to facilities. So we permit facilities, we inspect facilities, we uh, make sure that facilities are, are and, re and remain in compliance. And if, they're, if we find that they're not in compliance through an inspection or something like that, then we will take enforcement action. We also have monitoring programs, and uh, we're in charge of making sure that the air quality in the state uh, achieves the federal standards. There are st standards set at the federal level. So those are kind of the programs that we run as an agency. So the Clean Air Act permit program was required by the 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act, and it established the first uh, federal level operating permit program uh, in the country. Before that, there was constri federal construction permitting, and there were state operating permits, but uh, this federal operating permit program, what it did is it took and looked at a facility holistically. So uh, now facilities that have to have cap permits, it's for all the various units at a facility. So it's for major stationary sources, and we'll go through what a major stationary source is in a little bit, and they have to be renewed every five years. And so when they're renewed, uh, they have to go through public comment and review. We have to solicit public comments. We have to, and then we have to respond to those public comments and we have to see how are those public comments, how can we reflect uh, what people are asking for, how can we reflect that in the permit. So, you went too early, I think. So, 
a major stationary source simplistically is one that emits more than 100 tons per year of one of the criteria pollutants. The criteria pollutants are nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide. Am I missing one? Nitrogen dioxide, what? And volatile organic material, which is a contributor to ozone. So, uh, and as I said before, cap permits include all the various units at a facility and what the applicable regulations are for all of those units. They, it, cap permits have enhanced compliance and record keeping requirements. And then they're enforceable by the federal government, they're enforceable by the state government, and they also have citizen provisions in them so that they're enforceable by third parties. So a ca the cap permits are, are it, it was an improvement on the former permitting. So, it, you know, it, because it's got everything in there. Uh, and, and so when uh, regulatory agencies like our, when we go out to the facility, it's all listed there and the companies know all the things that they need to meet all, to achieve compliance also. Go ahead. So um, we receive, so how it, how it works is we receive an application from the permittee, the analyst, in this case, Anthony, reviewed the application. We put together a draft permit. We put that draft permit then out for public comment so that you can see it in, in general what it would look like. And then, uh, and then we solicit comment. And like I said, we take in comments, we review those comments, and then we determine are there changes that we need to make to the permit based on those public comments? Um, then, then we submit a proposed permit to US EPA for their review, and then we make a final decision, you know, and then they review it, and they, if they give us comments, we address those, and then we issue a final permit. Okay. So we're here tonight to talk about FIS, the FIS generation facility. Uh, you, you know where it's located. It was an electric power plant that started operations back in 59. The coal-fired portion of those operations ceased in 2012. They've had turbines, get, uh, they've had turbines at the facility since 73. And that, those are the units that are still operating out there. They've been, in, they've been operating since 73 at the site. Um, those units are required to fire or low sulfur or ultra low sulfur diesel fuel as of January 1, 2019, and they're currently meeting that. So, I mean, I know that's, that's a month away, but they, they've been meeting it, I think, for some amount of time. They've been kind of uh, in transition. And then they're operating as peaking units. Peaking units are units that are used, uh, they're called upon on demand when there's a demand for electricity. So, you know, typically you think of that as being like in the summer months when there's more, pe more people are using air conditioning. So they can come on and turn off in a much quicker time, at, you know, at, as compared to what you, the like the coal-fired power plant was a baseload plant. It essentially ran all the time, regardless of you know what the need was out on. It it provided the base load to the electric electric system, and then the peakers provide that peak power, and they can go up and down quickly. And then um, and then the, the Fisk station is subject to a variety of federal and state emission standards. Um, so, and all of those are listed in the cap permit. So they filed their initial permit in 95. Again, the, the law was promulgated in 90. The federal government, uh, you know, promulgated regulations, the state adopted them, and then, and then sources had a certain amount of time to get their applications into us. So they uh, submitted their application in 95. At that time, of course, they were still a coal-fired power plant. And 
then we um, issued their initial permit to them and all of the other coal-fired plants around the state in 2005. All of those, all of those, including this one, got appealed. So the appeal stayed the permit, and in that interim, we've been trying to resolve those appeals. And, and so, and of course, in the interim, the coal-fired portion of the facility shut down. They still have the turbines and have had the turbines at the facility, and they and so what this permitting transaction is is a res resolution of that appeal so they're in resolving the appeal we're taking out the coal-fired you know they when it was originally issued all of those coal-fired uh units were in the permit so we're taking those out we're updating the permit so that it it brings it up to date with current laws because you know the laws change over time and uh, and then making it applicable just to the units that are at the plant, which are the turbines. And then, so some of the new requirements uh, that are in the permit that apply to the turbines are the sulfur content for the fuel oil, it's ultra low sulfur diesel. Um, the, it has a new requirement for annual testing it has an incorporation of a construction permit uh, restricting the operation, you know, the amount of operation that the turbines can operate. And then uh, some sampling and some sec record keeping and reporting requirements. So it has eight disliff fuel turbines. Uh, and again, they're peaking units and they're designated low usage units, and so they can only operate uh, 20,000 hours a year. It, what? Mega, I'm sorry, megawatt hours a year. Uh, again, they use number two fuel oil, which is ultra low sulfur diesel, which is a limit on the amount of sulfur that can be in the fuel oil. And uh, you can see what their heat input is for winter, summer, and then combined. And the total uh, rated capacity for the plant is 34 megawatts. So here's uh, just kind of a sample of what the emissions were like uh, when it was operating as coal-fired power plant, and what the emissions are like now that it's operating as a turbine with just the turbines. And you, obviously there's a significant reduction. Now, of course, as being peakers, depending on the year, depending on uh, you know how hot the summer is, this was a relatively hot summer, you know the the it's going to go up and down, but it's not going to be like eleven. It's going to be probably seventeen was a higher year than than normal. Go ahead. Oh, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, this has various compliance status, but I, we, in reading through it, what you'll see is the facility is in compliance with all the various different uh, measures that we look at when we look at compliance of a facility like this. And so we can, I, if anyone wants to come back to this or look at it later, but I mean, essentially just all these things are saying the facility is in compliance. And then, so that's pretty much all I had. It's, you know, for us, these are, it's a relatively small source. I know it's a, ca it's a cap source, but it's a pretty small cap source. Um, but we do have, uh, and I wish that was a little bit bigger, but we do have a couple links on here. Uh, you can get, we, okay, so a, a couple things. We, so we had a comment period. People requested this meeting. The comment period ended, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna reopen the comment period uh, until December 28th, so you can submit written comments to us. You can send them to me, to my email address if you want, to submit written comments. 
uh, they have to be to me by December 28th. And I will uh, post something up on our website at this address so that you have that information or you can screenshot it now, you know, so you have my email address and I'll send something out to the Pills and Alliance in Paro so they can distribute it. Or if you sign up on a card tonight, I'll send that information out to you where to get cut, where to send written comments into. Um, I think we also have, uh, you know, Chris is another resource at the agency. S submit the written comments to me, but, you know, in, in general, if you have questions about agency programs, you can call me, you can call Chris. We're always happy to, um, you know, help people talk, you know, explain our programs, explain what we can do and, and, and try to work through and, and address the issues that you have. So, um, so I was going to have questions and answers. And then, like I said, I know Pero had a, a few things that they wanted to say. Is that something you want to tackle, or you want me to? Yeah. Um, so uh, all of the cap permits, one of the standard requirements, and if it's not a standard requirement, we put it in as a special requirement, um, are to uh, maintain and operate the equipment in good operating and emission control practices. Um, and also, uh, there is record keeping that they have to use to demonstrate that they did the maintenance and how frequently they're doing the maintenance to demonstrate that they're, um, you know, doing that operating in a correct manner. Um, in addition to that, the majority of sources these days in our technological world also have electronic systems and computer systems that will alert them and they will uh, oftentimes take the permit conditions and they'll plug them into this computer system and set the timelines and frequencies for all these tasks to be done and it will send the person responsible for that um, you know, task to be done and then they have to enter into the computer system then that they actually did the task. Yeah, and I would just uh, like, Brad, to add to that, uh, when an inspector does go out, they will audit those records. They will look at those records uh, physically, and they may actually request a copy at the time, which would be attached to our report. It, it, the work, I think that the CAP work plan is uh, two years, every two years. I believe, I believe so. You, you can, okay. Same question. Let, let me go over here and then I'll come back to you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, as far as obtaining samples versus like getting samples from other places, do you guys collect your own samples? Are you, you talking about like the sulfur, sulfur limits? Yeah. So I think sulfur limits, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think sulfur limits are generally, uh, when they purchase the fuel, they're required to document, you know, the supplier is required to document. Is that correct? It's 
either that or they can't have a third party come in for a control or a control center themselves and send it off to a third party lab, have them analyze it and send it to a third party. But generally, most facilities are using uh, the supplier of the tool that they're yeah. using nowadays um, because the transporters and the distributors yeah. all have federal. But, yeah, I mean, the, the ultra low sulfur diesel is a federal requirement now, both in vehicles and uh, and for this type of facility. I, I also remember before the boilers were turned off, um, I think the, the factory would use tracks, skin, yeah. 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 oh. okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so I guess it's a follow up of how the supplies are brought over to the Fisk plant because. I think before the Basel project happened, often you would see like kind of rail cars kind of back up into either Fisk or the building next to it. I'm just wondering, as of then versus now, how the materials are typically carried in to a power plant, or specifically this one. I, I, I to tell you the truth, that's not something that as the as the EPA that we regulate is how they bring fuel on onto site but okay you can answer that Um, so what I believe you're ta speaking to is the rail cars that you saw. That would be the coal deliveries when the coal operations were in operation. The diesel fuel, distillate fuel oil, number two fuel oil, ultra low sulfur diesel, you know, it goes by a lot of various names. Um, that's delivered by truck. Although it's not something that we regulate oh, no, now, we it's regulate. Delivered, but yeah, I, and um, We inspect. Well, inspect. Is that enough knowing that, I mean, I grew up in this area. I grew up on Loomis, right across the street from Kramer. But the, the thing is, um, ComEd, now Fisk, I, I know for a long time my brother was there. Uh, it's an old, old, old building. And now you're saying that you're going to come and check it every two years. Is that enough? What we check are the emission units, not not the building. And yeah, I mean, so a, a turbine. Let, let's back up a second. A tur turbines. It's a it's a well known technology. I mean, they they burn fuel to to produce energy. It's not. It's very straightforward. It's it's not something that's necessarily complicated. I mean, there are turbines or boilers and things like that. All, all over, and it's so. Yes, I think it is appropriate. the The schedule that we use for cap permits is appropriate, and and I I think that it. Well, I'll just leave it at that. Yes, I think it's a, an appropriate schedule. Go ahead. So there's only so much that they can increase because they've got the the, the twenty thousand megawatt hour limit in the permit. Um, yes, it, it has gone up. It has gone up a little bit. Uh, you know, they. It, although I I what I haven't didn't do is I haven't gone back to see how much it was used before. You know because if I. So I don't have a comparison to know. Well, it was 14 to 17, and a, it, you know, was it? Yeah, it. It certainly this this past year they used the turbines quite a bit more. It, 
Well, they can't, they can't operate them then. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an on-demand thing. So either they can use them or they can't use them. I, you know, if the if the needs out there and they haven't reached their maximum uh, megawatt hour limit, then they can r respond to energy demand. So, Mike, do you want to explain how how you Mike? Okay, do you want to explain how you measure the megawatt hours? Yeah. So the megawatt hours is um, is monitored with a monitor, and so they measure how many uh, how much power they're producing in a given hour, and it's just a multiplication. Um, and so they monitor and track that themselves, and then we uh, compare that with the limit. Again, it's a it's a record keeping. It's it's a record keeping, and there are requirements to maintain the monitor and keep it functioning properly. And within you know, and there are federal regulations and standards on those things as well, because the FCC regulates it. And there, I mean, there are many many standards for that kind of thing um, that they have to comply with. You had a follow up question. Okay, so, and again, chime in if you want to, but it generally it's, you know, so you know how much fuel, they, you know how many hours they operate, so you know how much fuel they burn, so then you know how much emissions there are. And so the emissions that are calculated in the permit are based on that maximum operation. Go ahead. So this follows up on the slide, you want to make it a little bigger, it shows a dramatic Yes. But the nitrogen oxides aren't down nearly by as much. It's fully 80% if I read the numbers right of what it used to be. And if they were going up to their maximum, what's the maximum megawatt hours per year? 20. And that's about 5,000 if I can see that. So if they went up, that would be all, that would be fully 34% of the old emission level of nitrogen oxides. And it would be occurring in a Is, so is that correct? Is that just a consequence of burning diesel? So now I see it's a 60 instead. So okay. I'll lower my numbers by 25%. But that's still a pretty big amount of nitrogen oxide emission. What's the maximum? If I'm reading that right. So that's the, so well, the NOx emission. So the NOx emissions in 2011 was 1,100 tons per year. And the NOx emissions in 2017 is 60.8. So that's about, yeah, 6, 10% roughly somewhere in that neighborhood. Correct. The megawatt hours um, in 2011 was 261 and 2017 went up to 5,080. What you see there is the uh, results of shutting down the coal operations. Not necessarily. Um, I would have to look into that and, and make sure that's true. One of the things in particular that I'm worried about is since it's a peaker, the particular air quality when it's running in the immediate area could be much more severely impacted than these numbers suggest. Because these are annual numbers. Correct. So that's over 365. How many days does the peaker did the peaker run in 2017? Yeah. Yeah, that number. So I think it would be interesting to get a per day of operation emission rate, yeah. so that the people understand I, I, what's going on in their air on the days it's running. What it, what I would suggest is to get into that kind of detail. Maybe submit that to us as a comment, and okay. then we'll respond to it. Okay. And yeah, so they, they can dig it out and maybe we can. Yep, yep, exactly. So, oh, hey, after you, we'll go to you, okay? I know you've been waiting. <laughs>
Okay. So, um, certainly you, you see the transformation in the state's energy profile. Uh, it is going more towards renewable energies. Now, that's not, we, we as the Illinois EPA don't regulate renewable energy. Usually that's the Illinois Commerce Commission. They, uh, to, to the extent that it's, it's regulated, it, there are some, uh, some regulations in, uh, in other, um, other agencies. Uh, but it, for, first of all, this is, this is not new operation at the facility. It's operation that has continued. It's been in continuing operation since 74. And we as the, no, the, 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 coal, the coal units closed down. That, that's not a nuance that we as that we we as our agency have never said that the facility was closed now they and not back in 2012 not recently they've always had this cap this cap permits been out there they the units have been in operation the coal the coal I'm not saying anything about that <laughs> I all I can represent is our agency, the facility has always had a permit from our agency. The coal-fired units shut down. But the, the turbines have always been there, I mean, have been there since 74, and they've continued to operate. We are the regulatory agency. So we issue permits to make sure that, facil that facilities have permits that list out all of the appropriate and applicable requirements, federal and state requirements. Hey, I'm going to go here and then we'll come over there. Um, let, me, let me start with one comment. In your, there are a number of different sources of people involved in this. Where we are, so we have a lot of truck traffic through here that you see so and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure that I have a real. Uh, I, w I will say this because I, uh, I've been involved in some of our more. You all may have heard of our VW uh, grant program, uh, and in general, mobile source emissions make up about. Uh, I want to say it was 84 percent of emissions uh, in the Chicago land area. Now that. That doesn't tell me what exactly is here, but certainly you're in the heart of the city. All the cars are coming in here. All the trucks are coming through here. So, but I, I, I don't really have a better answer than that for you. Um, you it was back over here. So, so we we are a regulatory agency. We determine if a facility uh, demonstrates that they would meet uh, the, the applicable regulations, then we're required by law to give them a permit. What typically happens uh, when it comes to public comment is that things get, we make, we, we take in the public comment, we review it, and we see what kind of modifications we can make to the permit. That's what typically happens. It, did, hang, hang on, I think, did you have a question? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, coal, the coal, coal fired power plants tend to be base load. They run, or, and nuclear plants, they're base load. They run all the time. This is only a peaker. Yes, we, we. So we can say as many times as we want. Isn't that great? Right? But until we change the law, until we grant those politicians that ask for our vote, our aldermen, our, any of the officials, grab them by the neck and say, you better listen to us. Because what's going on is these guys are coming out here and they're telling us this stuff, but they cannot change the law. So we can see other 
Well, so, so when it comes to turbines, turbines are a known technology. The turbines generally can meet, as long as they're using, you know, uh, you know, the appropriate fuel, and if they have, and they follow the restrictions that are in their permit, they're going to meet emission requirements. Oh, okay. Let me go here, and then we'll go you and you and you. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay, fine. So, to the um, to the lady that uh, was speaking about uh, whether our comment, whether your comments are are worth anything or do anything, um, Anthony and myself, we actually work on the permits and develop the permits ourselves, and and with others in the agency in consultation, and it goes through several reviews. But um, we actually do read every single comment, and we have to respond to every comment. And um, there are comments on cap permits in the state of Illinois that have made changes to areas of a permit. Um, one of the big areas that we do have authority, um, that the regulations give us some discretion to make changes in the permit for, is in the area of monitoring. Um, so if we believe or we have comments that would suggest that maybe some more frequent monitoring or testing or maybe some additional records are necessary, we do have that ability to do that. So comments can make a difference. And, and like I said before, you, there's certainly there's certainly you're seeing a transition in our energy system uh, to more renewable fuels, and it's a good thing. Um, it, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but I, I will say when I started at the agency back in the early '90s, uh, there there was a lot of talk of uh, waste energy facilities, and. I, I tell you, I was in a lot of pretty heated meetings because of the concerns about that. So, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, we we as an agency don't take don't take a stand. We're a neutral agency, but um, you know. Anyway, so we said here, and then we were going to go here, here, and here, and then and then I'll come back to you, ma'am. Go ahead. Right. regulate 14% of the pollution that flows in our communities. We, you, you're correct. We do not, uh, aside, aside of our monitoring. 86% yeah. for the Illinois EPA is on, on your table. It, it, that's the way that the laws are, are established right now. Is, is we, now, now, obviously, we are required. It, well, my PowerPoint's not up there. I, I, one of my first slides, I talked about some of the things that we do. And one of the things that we do is we monitor ambient air quality, and the federal government sets what are called national ambient air quality standards. And those are health-based standards for the criteria pollutants, those criteria pollutants I mentioned. So, so one of the things that we have to do is the federal government sets the standards, and then we as the state have to make sure that the air, we have to come up with plans to make sure that the air quality complies with it. For so, 14%. no, no, for the state, for the ambient air quality, so, for the ambient air quality. So, so for everywhere, everywhere in the state. So, so there's, 
so we have monitors around the state, and obviously there's more in the Chicago area because, no, there's more than that. There, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about ozone monitors because in the state, our primary struggle is with ozone. And in fact, the ozone standard was just lowered uh, just this past year. And we're gonna have to, and so the state's gonna have, to, we have to come up with a plan on how we meet that standard. And we have to do it by a, a certain date. And off the top of my head, I don't have the date, but it's several years out. The federal government tells you, you have to meet, you have to come up with a plan and the plan has to improve the air quality so that the ozone meets the standard by a set date. And so we're going to have to come up with a plan that addresses that. And I'm not sure what's going to be in the plan yet, but it certainly the fact that mobile source emissions are a very big driver of, of ozone in the Chicago area is something we're going to have to take in under, under consideration. Megawatt hours. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I meant 17. If we give you 20,000, are you guys asking for a permit to add more units to our area? No. No, 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 no. There, there are peak and power plants all, all over. And so different, different ones will turn on depending on what the demand is, you know, when, when demand spikes. So, but they have a 20, they, their permit has that limit in there. So, so when you get to this, do they ask for permit for more units? No, 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 no. I mean, it, in theory, they could ask for more units. There's nothing in the law that would, but if, if they would ask for more units, they'd have to get a construction permit from us, and we'd be back here talking to you again. I, all I'm saying is, the per, they don't get permits, you know, real quickly. It's not like, oh, we want we uh, there's going to be higher demand next week. We want we want to haul in some turbines. We it's a it's a process. They have to get a construction permit from us. And again, we would be back here talking with you guys if that was the case. So, go ahead. And then. Okay, I appreciate that. I, w I do want to make one real quick clarification. You had mentioned particulate matter and then ozone. We we are in attainment for the for the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for particulate matter. Uh, for ozone is what we are not meeting the standard right now. But you're correct. It's the NOx and 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 VOM uh, that contribute to ozone. And so and you're also correct that that's you know when people tend to use more electricity because there's more, it, it, we have had programs in the past where certain types of manufacturing, because we, we wanted to shave that ozone and kind of keep it below the level and, you know, area-wide, um, but it wasn't typically targeting these types of units because these types of units have to kick on to meet that electric demand so that we don't have brownouts or blackouts or things like that.
Sure. And let me let me also just say w one thing. It, it, that's all true. And this isn't it, it, we we have a federal standard and we have a new federal standard that we're not meeting. You know, but what happens is over time, the federal government lowers the standard. So the ozone standard has been changed every so many years periodically. So uh, just to put it into perspective, you know, since 1970 when the, and I think everyone knows this, but just to say it, air quality has improved tremendously, tremendously. And it's, it's, the air quality now would have been in compliant, it would have been compliant, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. It's not compliant now because we keep lowering that standard because we want to keep improving air quality. Ma'am. Um, I'll just to address the first comment. We receive comments from all the public, including elected officials. So they certainly can submit public comments to us. Anyone can submit public comments to us during a comment period. Um, but it's not it, it's not a vote. Our our dis decisions are made based on the regulations and whether a facility will meet those regulations so and then what was the second part of that air monitoring citizen air monitoring and i don't know i do you want to talk anything about citizen air monitoring the uh, you know our monitoring network our and in particular our ozone monitoring network because that's what uh that's what we're not you know that's what we have to meet right now that's what we're is a federally mandated how we go about, and we have to come up with a plan, we have to develop a plan every year, we have to have so many monitors, they have to be in certain locations, they have to do specific kinds of, you know, they have to meet certain standards, and it's, it's not just, you know, put one on the corner, and they, it, and I'm not discounting citizen monitoring because there have, US EPA has, for certain types of, not for ozone, for other types of, um, of uh, pollutants, they've um, tested certain types of kind of small local community monitors. I'm not sure, you know, not being with the US EPA and not, and not having conversations too much with that group, I'm not, real clear on what the results are um, from those, but that's something you could talk to them about. But when we talk about the air quality and particularly, the, you know, like NOx emissions, NOx drives ozone formation, it's, um, it's more about, that's, that's a, ozone forms in the atmosphere, it's a chemical reaction, it takes time, and it, that's something that you need a wide, broader 
network like we have established in the state more so than local community type thing. Let's go here and then here. Well, <laughs> I think we, I think what we want is we want people to submit public comments to us and then we'll review those comments and see what kinds of changes that we can make to the permit. Okay. I think it's the simple. And then when it comes to the air monitoring, we do put, we, our monitoring plan, uh, we have to put it out for public comment every year. Uh, we post it on our website. So um, if you ever want to look at that, it, it is available on an annual basis. I, I, again, I, we, we put together a draft permit. We put together the draft permit that we, th we think is a good permit uh, for the facility. So we're saying, you know, if we don't receive public comments, that's what we would issue. We would, we would finalize it and issue it. Uh, if we receive public comments, and then we'll go through those public comments, and if they, if they seem to be suggestive that there could be changes that could be made to the permit that would enhance the permit, then we'll see what we can do about, about making those changes. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, the short answer to that question is no. There's no state or federal laws on the books that say, hey, this is an environmental justice community, which, oh, by the way, the definition, you know, varies throughout the United States as to what is an environmental justice community. But obviously, we at the Illinois EPA consider this an area of environmental justice concern, and one of the reasons why we're uh, enhanced public outreach is so important to us. But more directly to your point, I know that um, for sure on the federal level, I think the, I'm thinking the senator from New Jersey, I was reading an article about it, about his push for to try to put some teeth into the concept of environmental, because there is nothing. There's nothing on the federal level. You, you're hard pressed to find the words in a law, period. So we did see, which wasn't a tremendous victory, right, in future energy jobs acts, there was a lot of uh, folks, a coalition before I became the environmental justice officer, I wasn't directly involved in it, but becoming aware of it now, that all banded together and, and really lobbied specifically say, hey, in this future Gen energy jobs act, let's recognize environmental justice, let's tell the um, power agency to define it, Illinois Solar for All and make some recognition. And so I think to some extent that was a major end road. And so maybe in the future we'll see more and more. I think there's only more and more attention being put specifically on this issue of environmental justice and then kind of looping back around. So, you know, the answer is no, but we'll see in the future. Looping back around sort of to the concept of citizen monitoring and what that means and how we can use it. From my perspective, which is maybe a little bit different from, the, well, is a lot of bit different from the permitting folks as to what they can use as far as data that's credible and meets all the, there's all sorts of rules and regulations as to what is usable data and you get into all this minutia. But what I think I've seen that's, that's um, potentially powerful with the purple air monitoring and, and I and keep track of that and my day-to-day -day is to empower citizens to then start just like you all are doing is 
working at it from a local level, working at it from a state level, working at it from a federal level, and really trying, in it, in it, I think that that data, while it can't directly feed into us changing our regulations, because that's just not how it works, one thing that it can do is to show folks, and, and know having many conversations with Ms. McNamara here about McKinley Park and Matt Asphalt and, and some of the other issues that are going on around here, is, okay, well, this is sort of, so we're, so I'm saying, well, we can't regulate truck traffic. Okay, well, who can? Who, who, and so it just paints a broader picture, I think, for all uh, officials, whether they be state like ourselves, federal, or your, your local officials, all of us, it's just more information, it's helpful, it helps paint a, a wider picture. I'd like to just jump in and uh, the gentleman in the far back that was asking about the types of conditions that we could potentially change or add or enhance in a permit. Um, there's six fundamental types of conditions that you will find in any Title V or CAP permit and those would be regulatory requirements, construction permit requirements, monitoring requirements, testing requirements, record keeping requirements, and reporting requirements. So those are the six fundamental conditions that we would put in a permit. Um, those are the six basic Title V requirements that we are mandated to make sure are in the permit, that US EPA will look at our permit and make sure we have done that. Um, when it comes to uh, what we can do and what discretion we have in a permit, um, and oh, by the way, you won't find all permits have all those conditions. Some of the conditions, you know, some of those things aren't appropriate or necessary or even applicable to certain sources. Um, so when it comes to uh, changes, um, when there is monitoring involved, okay, uh, a regulation will lots of times have monitoring already in it and be required. Um, you will oftentimes see us just use the regulatory requirements because the US EPA or the state or whoever wrote the regulation 
has gone through the process of making sure that that is adequate monitoring, it is capable of demonstrating compliance with the requirements in that rule. Um, the same with construction permit requirements also. Um, Generally speaking, our construction permit engineers that write those permits will put in monitoring that is adequate to demonstrate compliance or necessary for compliance purposes. And so we'll just carry those requirements over. But where you will find us uh, have discretion and where comments can make a big difference is when you have regulations that don't have monitoring in them. They're very old uh, regulations that have never been modified, changed, or or updated, um, we can enhance that monitoring, supplement that monitoring, or even put monitoring in, you know, so that the source has an ability to demonstrate compliance. And lots of times you will see us enhance um, record keeping and reporting requirements because those may sound like they're very basic and fundamental, but they really are very important components of the overall uh, permit and how it functions and gets implemented. So I just wanted to give you that. You're welcome. Okay, so um, I believe, oh, so the question um, that she asked was there was a recent um, enforcement action uh, resolution actually in the court system um, against Midwest Generation. And so basically way back, um, I don't remember the years exactly, but it was sort of back in like 2005-ish time frame, I believe. Um, uh, some citizen lawsuits were filed uh, against Midwest Generation. It was not any one individual plant. It was for all of their plants, if I remember correctly. Um, that citizen lawsuit has made its way through the courts this many years, and what you're speaking to, I believe, without seeing what, what you're referencing, is a uh, consent decree uh, where the company and US EPA and the citizen um, organizations um, came to a resolution and agreement on what they would do to resolve those um, enforcement actions, if you want to call them that. Um, <clears throat> and so that is the document that says, here's what Midwest Generation is going to do. Um, you know, to fix those issues back when the suit uh, was brought forth on them. Uh, for FISC at this station, uh, the consent decree only requires that they maintain the retirement of the coal-fired operations because that was the uh, core basis for the lawsuit was the um, was the coal operations and the emissions from the coal operations. The, uh, the, so, the, you know, Pero was gracious enough to help s set up this meeting for us. So I'm going to let them uh, make their presentation. We'll take your question real quick, and then I'm going to let them make their presentation. We're, we have the room until 8, though, and so when they're done with their presentation, we're certainly open to answering more questions. Talk a little bit about the future jobs. Not jobs, like resources. No, for no, business, no. Business. I'm talking about law, or no, like, uh, is that? I can give a short answer. Okay, just a short. Uh, <laughs> question. Yeah. So, so the I think the question has to do with loans, grants, money available to help sort of propel renewable energy, and and investment, and and the Future Energy Jobs Act which the Illinois Commission on Environmental Justice has 
been working on the environmental justice portion and in advising the power agency as to how they approach that issue. But anyway, so we're, the Illinois EPA is not directly involved. We don't run that program, but it's a big sweeping bill and there's money, there's renewable energy credits, which is sort of the, uh, it, it pays people to put on solar. So there are, this Future Energy Jobs, what it did was tried to re, uh, rebalance or re-energize, I guess that's a bad pun or a good pun, the whole renewable sector. So for a while we, so we've seen explosions and wind, especially downstate where we are, and solar was just kind of fizzled out. And this has given these renewable energy credits, which is a major incentive. There's brownfield solar. That seems to make sense, right? Put a big solar array on a former, there's a huge site in East St. Louis, the Alcoa site. There, there's nothing can be done with it, but you could put solar on it. And, and so there's, I think there, there's no real short little answer, but there's many, many aspects to that. Again, the Illinois Power Agency, and there's workshops that they're doing right now. They just did one for Illinois Solar for All, which is about low-income environmental justice communities. But there's more, there's more and more, if you go check out, they're doing more and more workshops, the physical locations in Chicago, but you can get on a, and do webinars. There's a ton of information, and I'm by no means an expert. We, we do have, not exactly, but we do have, well, we, right, the, the Volkswagen settlement, which is not necessarily, but that's not necessarily, it's in the same, so we had the Volkswagen settlement, $108 million, that as far as the cheating scandal, and we're gonna do a series of funding opportunities. Now, it doesn't dictate renewable, but electric buses, maybe charging stations, it doesn't really quite so fully get out that, so but the the Volkswagen settlement was very. It was a federal settlement. It's very specific as to what you can do, and that's not. It's it, renewables wasn't. So we we have. Well, and, and the other thing is, it's it's for vehicles. It's not for solar or wind power, or, because again, it was a, it was a federal consent decree which dictated that the money had to be used for, uh, to re retire old diesel engines. So it's a, it was a court case that said that's what the money had to be used for. But they weren't interested in the same thing. Well, so, and that's where I was gonna say, this doesn't fit in exactly, um, but you know, certainly a portion of what we're saying to cite our money for is electric, is, uh, you know, new electric vehicles and uh, infrastructure. No, electric cars can be charged using renewable energy. Yes, there's, there's, that's certainly the case. We, I mean, I guess just step back a second. Again, the Illinois EPA is not the power regulatory agency for the state. That's typically the Illinois Commerce Commission or the Illinois Power Agency. Um, okay, so I'm going to let them make their thing, and then, like I said, we'll come back and we'll. Um, so I just want to thank the EPA for coming out and um, sharing this meeting with us. So this will be a very brief presentation, a little bit about Perro, our kind of um, ideas on on this site, what can be done. Um, and continuing to empower you guys to become a part of Perro, anybody can, um, and such. So um, my name is Alex Reyes. I'm a Perro volunteer for about the last two years. Um, and there's lots of Perro members here. Louder, <laughs> speak louder, okay. Uh, there's lots of Perro members here. Um, so we have a lot of people in the community who on and off have been part of it. And so um, thank you all for being here. So for anybody who hasn't heard of us, what is PERRO? Um, so PERRO stands for Pilsen Environmental Rights and Reform Organization. Uh, it's a grassroots community group. Like I said, it's all volunteer based. Um, we all have day jobs and other stuff going on. So we all care about uh, Pilsen, environmental justice. Um, it was formed in 2004. And we're about fighting pollution of all sorts, of all sources in Pilsen. Um, we believe that all people have the right to live in a clean and healthy environment, regardless of class, 
race, um, any of those intersecting factors. And our mission is to spread awareness about this concept of environmental justice and make Pilsen a healthier place to live, work, raise families, have families. Um, uh, so anybody who speaks Spanish, I don't know, we didn't ask that at the beginning, but this will be bilingual in terms of the slides. Um, so, and we'll come back to this, but we have bi-weekly meetings every other Wednesday at La Cebollita, so anybody can come, join us, be part of the conversation. Um, so what has Perro done? So I'm not gonna go into everything, I'm just gonna highlight a few of the things, um, and tie them back to this presentation. So what has Perro done? So along with the EPA, we've also done a soil remediation project in Pilsen. Uh, someone mentioned H. Kramer earlier, so there was found to be uh, certain homes in certain trajectories from where H. Kramer was and the pollution in the soil. Um, and so the EPA uh, did a survey of homes and people who wanted to have their soil remediated. Um, I don't remember quite the number. Rose, do you remember the number of homes that were? So yeah, 64 out of 128, so about half or so. Um, uh, we've also, uh, the most recent thing that we've been working on is lead in the water. So we did four uh, water expos um, around Pilsen, um, addressing uh, possible increase in uh, lead in the water for residents who have lead service lines, uh, following all the water main replacements. I'm sure you have heard, the Tribune did all the articles about, you know, they did fine, they weren't notifying fa uh, households. Um, so we distributed about 300 water filters, lead water filters uh, for Pilsen residents, completely free. Just come, learn about it, get a free filter. Um, and next slide. Uh, and then, um, Pedro was also instrumental in shutting down uh, the Fisk coal plant. Um, our members, Leila, who's not here, but she, um, along with Greenpeace, and were instrumental in the fight against shutting it down. Um, so that leads into the conversation tonight about the proposal, um, the permit, but also our ideas at Perro, um, all our members of what can be done, alternative ideas instead of keeping this uh, diesel peaker plant uh, going. So um, one of the ideas is a green space proposal. This is not our green space proposal, it's a green space proposal um, by a grad student. Um, but, um, you know, green space, we know that Pilsen, um, compared to the rest of the city, does not have as much green space. We could always use more green space. Um, and actually, when the coal plants did close, Pedro did submit and had a presentation on ideas, proposals for uh, what could be done with the with the space, um, and part of it was also green space. So this is just an idea. We don't have a super specific plan for it, but a proposal. Um, so the city's proposal, from what I heard, I wasn't around when uh, the coal plants shut down and the fight and everything, but the city did have some sort of community meetings about what could be done with the space. Um, I, I heard it was something about like two years of a, of a talk and then in the end they came and said, we're gonna do a bus garage. That's what we're gonna do with that space, a uh, bus depot. Um, so that's sort of on the city's, uh, the city's plan proposal with the, with the space. Um, we know that in Little Village, Hilco has come in um, with the Crawford plant, and so they're um, making this like one million square foot distribution, which is gonna just continue to increase pollution in the area. That's something that we don't want. Um, there's sort of been talk that maybe Hilco is interested in this space as well, and we definitely don't want that. Um, El Vejo, which is the next slide, um, Kim Wasserman, who's the director there, was very vocal against it, um, the group and other community groups. Um, and unfortunately, it still went through the city council. Um, something that was also kind of put on by the city is this troop, 
Stroop Street Park um, that kind of went nowhere uh, that is sort of adjacent. Um, it, it adds green space, but we also kind of feel like it's a distraction to the, the Fisk site and what can be done there. Um, yes, it's an addition. It would be great to have more green space and have what's going on, but this was canceled. Nothing ever went with this, so we just want to make, make note of that. It has been already referenced many, many times, this Volkswagen um, settlement, um, which while it doesn't address renewable, um, it does address um, alternatives. Um, so this environmental, oh no, mm -mm, go back. <laughs> um, so it's a $108 million uh, to the state, um, specifically for this environmental mitigation trust to uh, reduce um, NOx emissions. So we'll kind of get into where this kind of comes into some sort of proposal or idea that Pedro has. So um, a few ideas, um, the green space we talked about, and that's something that um, can, you know, we can keep talking about at meetings if you guys join. Um, but a couple of our members, Jack is very, he's, he's has Ailey Solar, so he has lots of ideas, and, and Troy, they've kind of come up with this idea on the, not just a depot, a bus depot, but an electric bus depot. Um, so making battery powered peakers, so again, while not, renewable, um, something that's not going to contribute or increase pollution, particulate matter. Um, it can be financed by the Volkswagen uh, settlement. It can utilize existing electrical infrastructure, getting to that zero local emissions. Um, it can create jobs, 400 green jobs, approximately. I'm not sure where that number came from, but <laughs> we, we want alternatives that also create jobs, so we're not um, you know, against solutions that bring jobs to the community, just something that's not going to contribute to the pollution that, that we, like we said, has a history of happening in Pilsen and Little Village. Um, green space, a boathouse being, you know, so close to, um, to the river and increasing um, access to the community, to the river, you know. Um, so in this, this, which we just learned um, about that happened yesterday, is that um, that Illinois awarded 19 million for cleaner bus and train engines. So there's actually 1.9 million that was given to the CTA to do this pilot for elect all electric buses. Um, doesn't sound like it's going too far because it's only three old diesel buses, um, but it's, it's a step in the right direction, we think. So that's exciting news um, and motivation for us to keep continuing to like advocate for different alternatives that reduce or eliminate emissions. Oh yeah. huge. Um, so, uh, which we've talked about before, but contacting local officials um, and really staying engaged and speaking out, um, you know, we're more empowered and make more noise when we're together, um, the more of us. So, um, we, these are just ideas. Perro is all about just coming together. We all come from different uh, industries and stuff. I'm a social worker, so I don't know too much about all the science, but I learn a lot and it gets me involved. And so I just want to like get everybody out, come out when you can. If you, I can't make all the meetings either, but um, we really just want to encourage you guys to, even if it's not with Pedro, to get involved and, and keep making your voices heard. Uh, so next steps, like I said, every other week, um, our meetings are at La Cebollita. So next one is December 19th, very close to Christmas, but um, come join us. We can do a brief about this. Next steps, we're always, um, everybody has different interests, right? Some people are really interested about this, some about water, some about, you know, soil. So just come and, and get your ideas out and yeah. So thanks to the EPA uh, for, um, they've been very great at getting back to us. They're very responsive. Um, and so, it, so it's great, even though we know that there's limited things that they can do, they really work with us on questions that we have clarifying. So thanks again. And if any other questions, we can open them now, so. Do you have answered?
I guess this, my comment is just about the future. Uh, we know that Chicago is going to experience more heat. It's going to get hot here. They say by 2025, 30, we're going to be having over 100 degree temperatures. Um, also with climate refugees, um, when the ice melts, Miami's going to go down. And they say Chicago is going to be one of the cities that's going to have to take in climate refugees. So more people means more cars, more diesel trucks, more trucks for food distribution. So it's sobering for me to think to live here, considering uh, the map that I saw of the National Resource, Natural De Resource Defense Council. They put out a map where you could see in the south side of Chicago is bright red, which means that we already live in a toxic zone for poor air quality. And it's only going to get worse. Fossil fuels are killing us. And if we do not have, we don't, we were not going to have a future <laughs> if we do not solve this problem. We cannot have more people coming, like this Pilsen itself is going to be really developed with more condominiums, which means more energy, which means more peak energy, which means they're going to have to have more facilities to have more peak energy, which means more diesel fuels, which is, it just exacerbates the problem. And so I don't see how we get out of this mess unless we really start focusing on what people have been commenting about renewables, uh, solar. The problem with solar also is we live in Chicago and we just heard about geoengineering. They want to do sun dimming, dimming of the sun. So if you're dimming the sun, our solar is not going to work, right? That's what I've been hearing about geoengineering, about solar radiation management. Um, so if they're dimming the sun, and if you have solar panels on your building, you're not going to get a lot of uh, solar power from, those, from that. Um, so we have wind, um, and I don't know what other options there are, but um, it's, I have a 10-year-old, and I don't know if I could live, continue living in the city with this kind of pollution that we're breathing in. Thank you, and thank you for preparing. Oh, go ahead. So the main comment I think we should emphasize a little bit more, I don't think it's really in the Illinois EPA's ability to force, uh, well, I think probably it must be uh, NRG that owns those people plants, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, so yeah. You can't it's really... Energy. 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 Yeah. The parent company of Midwest Generation. Yeah. Okay. So, Diesel features are old technology. There's newer technology that was referred to in the federal presentation and a couple other people mentioned it. They now have technology that's being implemented in California. There's some actually in the Chicago area. Really large battery systems that can help to regulate the grid. They absorb energy when there's excess energy on the grid. Back to the grid, you need it is, is another type of feature essentially, but it uh, doesn't have any emissions. And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying that the Illinois EPA force energy to do that, but this is what I really like to see. It's I've got a question as well. While we got you here, um, you know, the turbine, uh, the Volkswagen said it's for, for engines, for diesel engines. The turbine sounds like it's a diesel engine. It's sticking. No, no, no. It's, it's mobile source. Oh, okay. yeah. It's mobile source. That's very good. Yeah, I, I should. I, wow. I, I, didn't, I didn't think we were really going to get into VW tonight. Uh, the answer to the question, the turbine is not an engine. The engine is an internal combustion. Yeah. The turbine is for lack of a good texture. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, and certainly, you know, uh, I have a whole presentation on VW, if, if you got an hour. But, <laughs> uh, and I, I, I'm even, I, I'm certainly willing to come up and, and, and talk to you guys about it. Um, but yes, I, the, you, you're correct. The simple answer is we as the regulatory agency don't say you do this or you do that. We say, does what you want to do meet the regulations, but it certainly any of these kinds of issues, I know that Chris 
and and I certainly talk all the time about you know getting out and and talking to community members about the agency, about what we do and about our programs and any of those. If you if you want us to come back up sometime and talk about VW and our program, I, we're certainly willing to do that. Chicagoland area, and so I, I do understand the uh, industrial base that uh, the whole entire Chicagoland area and the Collar counties um, face, and so uh, and we do also have permit engineers and field inspectors that periodically will change positions and change staffing jobs, and uh, they've worked up here in Chicago, they've worked in St. Louis metro area offices, and so they, they we do have um, resources, but I do appreciate the comment uh, because it is very important to keep that in mind when we're, when we're trying to stay within the confines of a regulatory program. So thank you. Thank you, um, and, and thank you for that presentation. Um, that's a lot of great ideas of what the space could be used for, but to your point, um, if, if we don't get to the root of uh, what fossil fuels is doing to the planet and uh, the bigger urban planning plans, political plans, real estate plans the city has is uh, geared towards moving people and processes and not really saving the climate or planet um, or changing the economy <laughs> away from fossil fuels, uh, we might save Chicago to be a hospitable place, but all of these things that we're seeing around the planet will continue to happen and we'll, our situation could get more dire. Uh, but I do want to take the, thank the IEPA for patiently asking, answering all of our questions. There's a lot of informed people in this room. There's a lot of people with a lot of big ideas and have been part of these issues for a long time. Thank you for the IEPA for coming up and, uh, and, and working with us and uh, explaining to us the process that uh, we're confined to. Um, but um, the Pilsen Alliance has worked now with uh, Neighbors for Environmental Justice and El Vejo, and uh, we're partnering with other groups in Bronzeville and Calumet, and we, we would love to invite Perro to this coalition as we look at a more comprehensive way, um, an actual way to affect and change the trajectory of, of what's happening with these polluting places, mostly along the sanitary canal on the south part of the river. Uh, we're talking the asphalt plant, we're talking the redevelopment of the, Hill, of the Crawford Generating Station, Fry Hilco, we're talking about Fisk, uh, we're talking about what's happening in the Calumet. 
Um, one of the things that uh, we have this, we are coming together is that this is an opportunity. <laughs> you know, this uh, it's we're in a huge global crisis. We're in a crisis here with uh, these pollutants, and uh, this is an opportunity um, because uh, one of the things that I talk about, and I've been kind of I coined a term in 2013 when I started my studies in urban planning and policy, was a green plan manufacturing development. We have these industrial corridors. That's how Fisk and all of these uh, manufacturing uh, jobs along Pilsen and, and a little village um, came to be. If th this term that's being thrown around, the Green New Deal, we should be pushing, I think, I would hope, um, our community to bring that here and rationalize these processes to be a little bit more closed loop the way that the plant is to focus on renewable energy such as solar and wind and maybe even use the river somehow. And one of the things I was speaking to the IEPA was how much they understood about what the Industrial Hemp Act that Bruce Rauner signed into law to, um, about you know two months ago. Um, and you know it, it is still a very new thing that needs to be explored. Um, but industrial hemp is something that I have been tracking since it uh, first was being discussed in 2011. Um, it only gained traction because it was discussed in Kentucky, and Mitch McConnell finally caved into pressure to move the process along. Um, there's many states experimenting with industrial hemp, so now the federal farm bill um, will include regulations and more specifics as to how industrial hemp would play out. Industrial hemp um, could be a source to explore a new biodiesel. Hemp diesel is something that I don't think there's a lot of experts on in this room or, or anywhere because hemp has always been so heavily regulated, mostly because of its ties to cannabis uh, strain, but now we see which route that's going. So Pilsen Alliance, um, you know, we, we see the social justice, um, you know, uh, cross points, the crux of this issue being the, the, the legality of cannabis is why hemp was never able to be rationalized as a crop to help us with sustainable systems or to be explored as a bio uh, uh, fuel. Now we have that. Now we now you know cannabis. We're we're thinking you know J.B. Pritzker is looking at legalizing recreational marijuana. You know we um, and he will certainly wants to take up uh, the industrial hemp to see how that could offset the losses that the soybean industry has faced. Um, through you know, winning easy trade wars or something. Uh, so I, I would encourage us to, you know, as you signed up for uh, Pedro's email list, uh, I, I will also have uh, uh, an email list if you guys would like to sign up to um, come together for more charrettes to a space where we can rationalize out what, uh, what was possible. You know, uh, the IEPA, like I guess has been explained, is not the entity to really take um, what our collective vision would be moving forward, but they are an ally to let us know what is possible as we, uh, as we develop different ideas. So I ask you to, to come together to our next cross-community meeting. We're meeting quarterly, so we, we met in um, October. We'll be meeting again soon, either in January or February, and uh, where we'll try to bring a lot more of these issues into a context of what's possible What's a possible ask in the face of a, of a new governor, um, of an evolving uh, federal regulations for in terms of hemp and cannabis, and, uh, and, and a very, as it was pointed out, a very important city election, probably one of the most important that Chicago has ever seen, where we really have to show um, our best efforts to do what's best for, for our communities and for people. Um, just my two cents on this idea where we're talking about food processes and more people coming in. Um, urban agriculture takes a lot of capital to actually make it feasible. But if it's subsidized by high capital industries like cannabis and the possibilities of hemp, then we can bring urban agriculture to this green industrial, uh, to a green PMD, to bring the Green New Deal here. Um, and coupled with a lot of more sustainable ideas like what has been discussed here, um, so again, I, I just encourage everyone to attend these federal meetings, to attend a cross-community uh, meeting in a couple months, and to, uh, to be in tune with what, I, what we want to do with this space and these discussions. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, the IEPA. And I just wanted to say that before we take more questions. Thank you. All right. Do, do you have it, other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Here, here oh, Rose, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Hi, guys. I uh, wanted to just uh, let everybody know again that the um, next meeting that Pearl will have is on the 19th 
of December. I know it's a little bit before Christmas, but uh, if you guys could come to the meeting again, it's at 1807 South Ashland, which is at La Cebollita Grill Restaurant. So hope to see everybody there. Um, the more uh, we get together, then of course, we could all share ideas and people represent power and I really, really would like to see as many people participate more in meetings because that's what gives more um, power to the community. Thanks everybody for, oh, and if somebody didn't um, sign up on our um, sign-in sheet, can you please sign in? The sign-in sheet is right here on the table. And if you'd like to pick up a um, apparel button, thanks everybody. It, it, she has a question and then we'll go to you. And I just want to, I'll put my plug in for us. We do have our sign up here also. Again, if you want to receive uh, public notices, you know, in this community uh, from the Illinois EPA, you can also get it, they're online and things like that. But if you want to receive emails, sign up. Yeah. yeah uh So I was wondering, oh. is this funding going through a private source? Is it like open to the public? Is it open to bidding? Is it uh -oh. going through private contracts? Okay, so I'll, I'll go a little bit into the VW funding real quick. It's, uh, again, there was, I think as many people know, VW uh, was caught cheating. They were, uh, their emission systems in, in their diesel vehicles was performing different when the when the vehicles were being tested as compared to when they were operating, no, operating normally on the road. So they were caught, there was a court case, a federal court case, and uh, there was a, a very large settlement of which 100, Illinois' share of it is $108 million. It has to be used for mobile sources uh, to get rid of old diesel, and the, and the settlement uh, explains what you know, what that is. Um, you know, I'm just using general term old diesel and replace it with new uh, new modern diesel, tier four diesel, or alternative fuel or electric vehicles. Uh, and then it can be used for a few other very small things, like a, a small portion of it can be used for electric charging stations or administrative expenses by the state. So private entities uh, can, do, what, what we do, and we just went through our first round, is we'll put out a notice of funding opportunity. And, we're gonna, and what we say in that is, we will fund these types of vehicles in this type of area. In this first round, it was public transit trains, public transit buses in the Chicago metropolitan non-attainment area and it was an electric school bus pilot project in Cook County. Those, are the, those were the types of projects that we would fund in the first round. Other rounds in the future will fund various other things. Some of them may be private entities applying to get uh, to replace a diesel vehicle with, and when I say diesel vehicle, we're not talking about automobiles, we're talking about uh, trucks, and buses and trains and tugs, the big engines. And uh, so some of them might go to private entities. They have a higher cost share. They have to put up 50% of the new vehicle. Uh, other e governmental entities only have to put up 25% of, of the new vehicle. No, it can't. It can't be used for that under underneath the the terms of the consent order. So, I thought. Okay, but anyway, go ahead. I thought there was someone else, but yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, you go, and then I was just saying he'll go after you. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So yes, we 
we will we will accept written public comments until December 28th. After December 28th, the essentially the people here, and in particular Anthony, is going to have to go through all those comments and how can we. You know, because we, we recognize a lot of comments that we get aren't going to be technical necessarily in nature. It's not going to say condition 2-1-A says this, and I'd rather it say that. You're, I, if, if you have that kind of comment, great. <laughs> if you don't, if it's of more of a general nature, then we have to kind of interpret it and see how can we address, how can we address it in the permit. So then what we do is we take and we make what's called a proposed permit and we send it to US EPA. And US EPA has 45 days to review it, make sure that it complies with their program requirements and the laws and the regulations. And then they may have comments for us also, or they may not. And then uh, after that 45 days, then we have to address their comments if they have any or if they don't have any, then we'll move to you know, most likely an issuance of, the, of a permit. Is there a way for us to figure out if comments are taken into consideration on the permit or making changes? Yes. So additionally, what one thing, I, I'm sorry, I left this out, is we will put together a response to the comments. And we, when we make our final determination, we will issue that response to the comments. So it'll have the comments that we received and our, the agency's response and including any changes that we might make. Yes. So if you submit comments to us, we'll, we'll send you an email saying this is where you can find it and it'll be online. Okay. Back here. Sure. Yeah, there are. I mean, are you saying in Chicago or are you saying in the Chicago area? Yes, in Chicago and in the Chicago. I, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't even know why I went there. I, it took me a second to think of, of the various ones. But uh, yes, there are other ones around Chicago. I mean, to get a list, I would, if, if, if you wanted to give me, uh, you want to give me your name and email, I could generate a list. And, Do you, want me, do, you want me to, do you want me to talk about that a little bit? So the, the way that that's addressed, the way that the, we address it from an environmental protection standpoint is the federal government sets national ambient air quality standards. These are health-based standards for the criteria pollutants. I, I talked about this a little bit before. Ozone, those kinds of things. The, that's what the types of pollutants emitted from this kind of facility contribute towards is criteria, their criteria pollutants. We have national ambient air quality standards for those. And so what we do is we, when we look at compliance with those national ambient air quality standards, we've got our monitoring network. 
And then if, like in the case of ozone, we're not meeting that standard, we have to come up with a plan. And then what we do is we, we've got all, all of our permits, so we've got an, uh, an emissions inventory. And so then we can look at that emissions inventory and we can use it in our modeling and figure out where we need to drive emissions lower. Okay, and so that may result in additional, uh, additional uh, compliance measures, additional rules that would be implemented for certain types of facilities so to drive those emissions down so that we achieve, uh, we achieve our plan to achieve compliance with the NACs. That's how we address it in a much more holistic way than specific permit by permit by permit. Go ahead. And then we'll come to you. Okay, so we come up with a plan for ozone, and we look at we look at our emissions inventory. Diesel emissions are not the only uh, not the only source of of nitrogen dioxide, and so what we have to do is look at our emissions inventory and come up with the best plan and where we can drive reductions. And we we do it much more holistically than just a, and yeah maybe maybe it addresses diesel sources or maybe it addresses some other types of sources but we have to look at it much more holistically because an ozone the ozone non-attainment area is the whole metropolitan and it actually goes up in it, you know it's in Indiana it's up in to Wisconsin now those states have to address it separately but o ozone because it's it's a secondary formation. It, you know, becomes a transport, um, you know, um, pr pollutant, and so it, we look at it in a much more holistic manner, and we, and so we have to, we have to look at our whole inventory and really target it. You, you had a question. Well, I mean we. We we do have we do have certain state laws and, and but what, oh she asked whether we could have state laws uh, that were more stringent than the federal laws and yeah that's you know, certainly we've got all kinds of state laws but when it comes to especially things that have transport you want to have a federal law and it's a stringent law and it gets reviewed periodically like I said it just got lowered this this year. It, and it, it's, you want to have that federal law so that you don't have one state playing off against another state. So, you know, you've got it, everyone across the whole country has to meet this same standard. We, there's someone back here, and then I'll come to you. So, when you guys look at the information, I understand you look at it as an annual basis, right, as far as how much pollution is produced and not and everything else. Is it possible? They have they have short term limits too, right? Yeah. So what you're what you're what and I don't work in the construction permit group, but um, you know we work closely together and we have to incorporate those permits. But what you're um, you're speaking to is really uh, what a source has to do when they go through uh, construction permitting and and build uh, equipment from scratch or modify that equipment that's existing. Um, in those processes, there are regulations that we have to follow that spell out the steps by which we take to look at hourly emissions um, because ambient air quality standards are hourly. Sometimes they're three hour averages, sometimes they're daily averages, um, you know, and so forth. So what Brad was speaking to is what you will typically see in a construction permit is uh, hourly limits and annual limits. So yes, we do look at all types of, uh, you know,
So it depends on what the construction permit requires and or the regulation requires. Some regulations are uh, pounds per million BTU, uh, some are pounds per hour, some are PPM concentrations. Um, and so we will create monitoring if the mo rule doesn't already have that monitoring requirement in it that is um, consistent with that basis of the limit to make sure that they can demonstrate compliance. You absolutely can make a comment like that. If our permit uh, you believe is not sufficient in that area, you absolutely can. And then additionally, I, I'm not sure if you're getting at this or, or not, but some reporting requirements are not just annually, some are quarterly. I'm not sure if there's any monthly or not, but I mean, some reporting requirements are, are on a shorter duration also. You had a question. And if, I don't know, I may be, I, I hope I'm not ignoring this side of the room. It seems like I'm getting a lot over here. But anyway, go ahead. Excuse me, one frustration we have, I've been in the park. Uh, unbeknownst to us, uh, a permit was granted for an asphalt plant, right? As we sit down with uh, all the players that got that asphalt plant there, the question was, you have this asphalt plant right across the street from a park where all the kids are playing, right? We were informed that's not part of the equation, guy. We measure what goes in the stack. And you're having 200 diesel trucks going through this a day. Buddy, that's not part of our... And it just seems uh, it's like self-defeating. Yeah, it's like the map is not clear. The map is just <coughs> the plant, just the building. It's not taken into consideration. The people that live around it. A school of 800 kids would uh, uh, go to that's school a, a half a block away. There's a condominium right on the corner. I don't know how many uh, units are in there. Uh, the park where kids, uh, young men are there playing basketball directly across. So why won't the permit be a part of that to say, well, wait a minute, before I say okay on the permit, and I'd like you to answer on that one, why won't the permit be okay, I can't sign off on this permit until I see what kind of impact, like he's saying, the 200 trucks coming through, how does it affect the area? I, I, I understand the frustration. It's a, it's a question, it's a comment that we get a lot. And, it, and it's not a satisfying answer that there are different authorities assigned to different units of government and to different uh, agencies. And they, and you know, where something is located is not something that the Illinois EPA has any control over. That's a local zoning decision. What our regulations are to take into account is the emissions from the facility, and we and 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 we address that in a variety of ways, and with the recognition that there are facilities in heavily populated areas, and we respond to complaints, and we monitor facilities, and if facilities are um, seemingly, uh, you know we're getting more complaints or they seemingly are causing more problems, then we're gonna be out there more frequently. And not just us, I mean, when you're talking about the city, the city, the city is a one of our delegated partners and they go out also. So, I mean, I know it's not satisfying, but that's just the way that the, that's the way that, you know, the regulations are structured and that's the authorities that flow to the different, um, Govern, you know, the different areas of government. Sure. I don't know if this will they'll help make the process any more understandable for you or not, but the science and the health, it is taken into consideration. It's just taken into consideration at the time when the federal government is reviewing their uh, environmental emissions inventories and 
determining what level of pollution uh, as a population, as a whole, is safe. And, and based on that, they set those numbers. And then they say, okay, states, you have to now look at your inventories and come up with regulations to ensure that you're meeting those standards, okay? Can you hang on just a minute? So, um, and so then what happens is uh, those regulations get established on a state level based on the findings by the federal government and the mandates rolled down to us as a state. And then in addition to that, the federal government also looks at um, individual pollutants, so hazardous air pollutants, for instance, um, have their own regulations based on individual pollutants. CO has its own regulations. NOx has its own regulations. Those regulations are also being developed and written by the federal government and sometimes at the state level. All we are doing in a permit is taking those requirements that the science and the uh, research has already taken into account, right, and which those regulations are supposed to be protective of, and putting them in a permit to implement those to ensure that then the individual sources out in the areas are in compliance and we can maintain those levels. I don't know if that helps or not, but that's kind of how the process works. <coughs> So we, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I'm gonna address your question or, or not, but I'll go through it real quick. This is my email address. Submit comments, written comments to me, or, or, um, you know, or if you wanna submit them in hard copy, I can give you my business card and it has our address on it. Um, submit them by December 28th and then we will put together a written response to those comments. Now, if we get you know, five comments that all say the same thing, we're just gonna address it once. Um, and then if you actually want like, the emails that people submitted, you can submit a FOIA request. We don't typically post those up on the, on the web or anything, but you can, you can get them through FOIA. Yeah, and yeah. So the admission, I, I don't know if that's something that would be foiable or not because it's just, it may be too large. I don't know. I mean, you could ask, but the, it, it, what our admission inventory is, is we have permits for all the different sources in the state, the thousands of sources in the state that have permits from our agency. And they have, those permits all have permitted emissions, which are potential emissions. They're not their actual emissions. Actual emissions always, almost always, are below the potential emissions. But our inventory is based on the potential emissions from the sources, and they have to report, and then they have to report to us annual emissions every year. And we take all of those when we do models, because when we want to meet like the ozone standard, we run we run models to to run different scenarios. If well, what if we reduce these emissions this much? Well, what does that what does that show? And then if we reduce the emissions this much, well, what does that show? So it's it's not something that's readily available on our website or anything like that. But it, I guess I mean you could always ask you can always ask for it.
Well, see, but our emissions inventory, we actually, it is pinpointed because we know this source emits this much and is in this location. That's what a model is. It's this source is in this, emit, in this location and emits this, and it's, you know, its stacks are this high, and its building is this high, and then this one's over here, and that one's there, and that one's there, and then you put all those inputs into the model, and you run the model, and you see, you can see, you know, where the emissions transport, you can see, you know, what the, you know, when you look at temperature and you look at, you know, all the, all the, the um, meteorology, meteorological data, you know, you know, where you're likely to get formation and, you know, so you do have that, it is pinpointed. Good question. So, is it true that during this, No, they have their old state permits. But it, just it, 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 but it doesn't have, yeah. I mean, now, of all facilities, when new requirements are, are promulgated, facilities have to meet them, regardless of whether they're in the permit. But the permit makes it, puts it all together, makes it more enforceable, makes it clear what the requirements are for everyone. And, and it just makes it a much more enforceable document. You know, it, or it makes us have an enforceable document that covers the whole facility. So if, if we would, if, if they would submit a report to us that showed non-compliance, or if we would go out to the facility and do an inspection that showed non-compliance, then there's a process that we follow. And you know, we issue them a violation notice and say, this is what we found. And uh, then they have a chance to respond to that and, and give us what's called a compliance commitment agreement saying, this is how we're gonna address it and we're gonna do it in so long and then we, look at the compliance commitment agreement and either we agree or we disagree and if we disagree then we can take it to the next step which is to go to legal enforcement at the attorney general's office but it's a it's a whole process but in general you you know i think the vast majority of of non-compliance is, is resolved with the issuance of a vn and, and a facility coming back into the compliance I don't, I don't, well, to the second part, I don't think we have any, I don't think we have modeling data, do we? Actually, it's not the diesel itself that's actually being emitted. It's the uh, byproducts of the combustion of the diesel that's being emitted. And so, to answer your question, I can't give you any specific. You know, like here's how many feet it goes, here's how many miles it goes. But it is all very dependent on the pollutant itself. Uh, some pollutants may travel several thousand miles um, as they progress through the atmosphere. Others may travel just literally outside the property boundary, you know, or maybe inside the property boundary. Um, it just varies, and uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, the weather conditions, um, temperatures, uh, you know, again, the type of pollutant, uh, the temperature at which the pollutant is emitted from the stack, uh, all sorts of things can play into how far a pollutant uh, is dispersed. Um, you know, the stability of the atmosphere, all kinds of things. So um, it is very dependent and case specific. Well, I will. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, I will say that may be a first. <laughs> anyway. 
I do appreciate you all coming out. Again, if there are other things you want us to come out and talk to you about, we're more than welcome to, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we, we certainly, I view it, and my office views it as, a, you know, education of the populace on the environmental regulations is important, and it helps improve the agency's decisions. So I really appreciate you coming out.